Welcome to Courtside Moms. I'm Wendy Sparks. And I'm Stephanie Folahan. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Sarah Collier, the mother of Nafisa Collier of the WNBA, and she now plays with the Minnesota Lynx. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We are so excited to have you on our show today. We always ask moms to come on and speak about their special children because no one can talk about their kids better than the moms. So, Sarah, tell us about your daughter, Nafisa. Where did basketball all begin for her? Oh, Nafisa's basketball began, it, we were actually on the softball field. So I can't remember mm-hmm. how old she was, maybe third or fourth grade, but she was tall already. And um, we were playing, and a lady came over to us. Actually, I had known her before she did softball with my older brother and sister. And she said, is she on a basketball team? And we're like, no, we don't really know anyone to to start that she's like I have one can like bring her with me you know bring her on so we went and um like I said that was probably third or fourth grade and she was with her up until eighth grade um and then she that coach actually was coaching in the high school so she had to move to a different team um but yeah that's how it started by chance I think so Nafisa had the itch to play basketball and organize basketball, and she tried out for the AAU team in Jefferson City. However, she was denied. And then the Lady Warriors were born. Tell us about that. <laughs> so she actually, with that team, Kate uh, Foster was the coach and um, had played, and then there was an AAU team. They were not interested in letting her even try out, really. Um, so we said, we're going to make our own team. So my husband and Kay started a team called the War- the Lady Warriors. Um, my son, he's a year younger than Nafisa. He was in football, so we had kind of we thought we'd have like this little franchise. Um, so we had football for him and basketball for her, and um, then Kay was able to coach still for us. So, well, that's awesome that you invested and just made your own team so that your daughter can play. Yeah. But with having a boy and a girl, was it surprising that your girl wanted to play sports? No, we. I played sports. My entire family played sports. Um, Gamal has played sports. It was very important to us. Um, you know, the time that we knew we were going to have babies to get them involved in sports, I think it's important to be well-rounded as a human being. So whether it's music or sports or some kind of extracurricular activity, I am not musical, so I could not be of any help there. Um, so sports is what we naturally gravitated towards. And, um, so no, it wasn't surprising. We got them involved early in soccer, volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball, swimming, anything that we could do track, um, to see what, where their interests lie. Well, Stephanie, you have two kids. You have a a girl and a boy. Are your, (laughs) let's talk about your kids' activities for a sec. They're, they're about a, a year apart, just like yours, and we've got uh, a daughter who shows, like, tons of interest in sports, and then a, a younger son who shows none whatsoever. Was there a competition in the house between them at all? There's always been competition between them. She's older. She was a lot taller than him for many years. I think he finally took to a growth spurt about 16, because I was really worried that she was going to be taller than him. Um, but he's, he's about six foot three now. So yeah, there was competition from day one. They were always, um, in the backyard playing football. They were in the front patio playing basketball, wrestling competition from day one. And how tall is she now? She's like six, one, six, two, somewhere around there. So my husband is seven foot tall and I'm five, nine. And our daughter's already like head and shoulders of taller than everybody in her class. So Mm -hmm. obviously basketball has come up. Uh, on a daily basis and uh, we're we're also like concerned about like the people calling her a giant or sort of making fun of her so we're working really hard on building a confidence in her early so that the height is a good thing yes Um, how did you guys deal with that because it's obviously a great thing for guys to be tall but there's the the perception that tall girls have different challenges yeah she I think uh, you know during a time when you're going through that stage, you're awkward, you feel awkward, you're always, there's something about you that you feel insecure about. We just try to every day tell her how beautiful we thought she was and um, 
give her all of the reasons why it's an advantage for her to be as tall as she is. You know, there's many things that you can do um, besides basketball that, you know, your height allows you to do. Um, and then like with the boys situation, she was always uh, very insecure about all the guys being taller than her. So I would say to her, honey, when you get to high school, there'll be boys that are taller than you. So when we went to her freshman, so her freshman year at Jeff City, it's like just ninth graders. So she was still the tallest one. I'm like, well, high school, when you get to 10th grade, they'll be taller than you. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. We're moved, we're back to it's going to happen. We are in St. Louis at an all-girls school. I'm like, okay, college, honey, college. When you get to college, you're taller than you. You know, it's always kind of made it, bit, but um, just telling her every day how beautiful she is. That's awesome. So she played high school, and then she started getting offers, uh, Division One offers. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so in eighth grade, she was on an AAU team, um, and I think they were in Vegas. I wasn't there. My husband was there, and there were some media people that approached him and was talking about how good he was, and... Um, from there, like Mizzou was the first offer her eighth grade year. Um, and then they kept coming in as she went through high school. Um, we finally wound up having like 13 that could come to your house and, you know, your five official visits. And um, it was all exciting, but it was a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure for someone mm -hmm. who's in 10th or 11th grade to, to try to make a decision that is going to affect them Absolutely. Um, for the rest of their life really, but it, especially for the next four years. So uh, it was a big decision. Um, when we, what we would do is, so Wendy, I saw on one of your podcasts how you really were involved with your son's recruitment and, right. you know, just really wanting to, um, I wouldn't say control it, but you wanted to guide it and you wanted right. to make sure that what was happening was the best for him. And absolutely, um, we were the same with our, with Nafisa. Um, the calls needed to come through the mall, my husband, her dad first, and then when they came and to our house afterwards, we would sit down. We all had a notebook and we write the pros, the cons. And then, of course, the ultimate decision was hers. But we really felt like we needed to help navigate her towards right. um, towards the decision, not choosing the making the decision, but help, helping her of to course. make that decision. Well, because mm -hmm. they're still young, right? I mean, yes, it's good for them to want to choose a school but the reasons why she would want to choose it and us as parents sometimes is not the same reason right so right. with my son yeah I, I i had to guide him and say listen mm -hmm. i'm you know what i mean let's look at these options and two i was green at this whole thing i didn't know i mean basketball in canada is completely different from the u.s like mm -hmm. we don't have uh, prep schools in montreal or that's where my son was raised so we didn't have all of that it was just high school you know mm -hmm. it was just public high school and if you had a private high school it didn't mean that there were scouts or anybody coming to watch your games so I had to really ask a lot of questions and mm -hmm. and then make sure I was asking the right people right. and then when all these letters came it was it was mm -hmm. overwhelming I mean, it was it was awesome but it was overwhelming at the same time because as a parent you don't want to make that that wrong decision and so my son and I we we, we had a lot of conversations but for him he just wanted to play yeah, right. He didn't care. He just, he just wanted to be like, yeah, just send me on a roster. We're good. Like, let's just go. And that's all it was for him. So anyway. So, <laughs> so she ended up choosing UConn. Mm -hmm. What was the decision behind that? So we, that was, I think, our fourth visit. We still had one more to go. Um, and we had already, as a family, decided, okay, we are, no one's going to make a decision on the trips. We will come home, digest, talk, and then tell us where you, where you want to be. So we're all good with that plan. But when we got to Yukon and started looking, um, when you walk into the gym, I mean, it's, you see all of the banners, you walk right. into the coach's office, you see all of the trophies you're hearing from someone like coach Gino Oriyama telling you how he sees you fitting into your, his program. And she just said, this is how she chose our high school too. Cause when we moved to St. Louis, it was a feeling for her. We moved, or when she went to Connecticut, it was a feeling for her. She said, I'm done. This is it. This is home. This is where I want to be. So what was home. it like playing for Coach Ariama? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, it could not have been a better fit for her. Um, and I think there are pros and cons um, for any school that you go to. 
and it was, it's tough. I, I don't think I've talked to one mom of a, a girl who went to UConn who didn't say, oof, this is tough. I think it's tougher on us than it was for the girls, um, but their yeah. freshman year is really, really, really tough. Uh, a little thing that's a little different than for the girls than it is for the boys, the girls have to go through three years of college or they have to be 22 the year of the draft. So you are really, really committing to a program. Mm. Although I think there's a lot more transfers going on now, but um, it was scary. I dropped her off for summer school, 19 <laughs> hours from home. I'm crying. I'm driving back to the <laughs> 15 minutes to the interstate. I was like, I got my problem. The enchanted board for basketball. That's awesome. I, I just had a mild heart attack when you said 19 hours from home. Like, my only concern in thinking of sending my daughter anywhere, like, to be honest, she's only four, so there's no offers <laughs> yet. But, you know, thinking future wise, I can't imagine at this point sending her anywhere. And part of that does come from the limited resources in Canada. So we, we're not as advanced as the US is in, you know, terms of basketball. So I want to keep her home for oh. selfish reasons, but I know she'd have to leave if there's any chance yeah. that she could play somewhere. Well, yeah. the hardest decision as a mom is making that decision to let your child go. Yes. And when my son was given these offers, well, first of all, he played AAU um, in Montreal. And then after that, at one point, we were like, he has to go to the U.S. because we felt yeah. that's where a lot of the opportunities were. And he played for a team in Rhode Island. So oh, wow. we were always in Rhode Island. So you can only imagine, you know what I mean? If they called us and said we had a game, it wasn't a 20-minute ride. It was hours. And just get in the car and get to that home game. You know what I mean? So my home game was like seven hours away. And, <laughs> and we did that for years. So, uh -huh. But you know what? That's the best investment as a parent that you can do for your child. If you see that they're, they're wanting to do something, I mean... Uh, as a parent, I feel that we really should be involved. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so at UConn, mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want to play for the Huskies, right? <laughs> Originally, she wanted, she didn't. So when we, to be quite frank, we were just going to UConn because it was Gino and UConn. Mm -hmm. um, but she had always planned to play against them. Like, she wanted mm -hmm. to be. That's right. Um one of the decisions though, when we were there and she got to, you know, see all the trophies and all the banners, she said, okay, well, if I can't beat the best, I want to be the, you know, I want to be the best. Um, certainly want to play with the best. And she felt like if she's playing against those girls every single day in practice, it's only, she, you know, only going to get better. And if she could prove herself as one of the best players at UConn, then she knew that she, you know, but, mm -hmm. Well, in her four years at uh, UConn, I mean, she had a stellar four years. Um, twice she was the AAC Player of the Year. She also was a champion in 2016. I mean, no wonder she got drafted. So let's talk about the draft process. How does that work? Because, you know, we talk to a lot of NBA parents, but we really don't know the perspective from WNBA. So can you share that with us? Well, there are only 12 teams, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you kind of know, I mean, it's very, it's a lot li more limited um, pool. We really didn't know where she was going to go draft night. E you know, even walking in, we had heard anywhere from one to six. Um, it was exciting. It was fun. The girls got their hair and makeup done. Um, they got all dressed up. It was, it was magical. It was surreal. Um, I never thought back in third grade when Kay approached us. <laughs> That that's where we would be in April 2019, but um, oh gosh, she just had so much fun. She wound up being drafted six, but she couldn't have been drafted um, to a better team for her. She went, like you said, to the Minnesota Lynx and has been great with Coach Cheryl Reeve and the team. She for Nafisa, I, she is not someone who her life is basketball. If that makes sense, right? She. We've started out very early from the, from the time they were little, even like four, and we started putting them into soccer. Like, we don't care if you are the best. You just have to do your best. Right. And you, like, sports is not who you are. It's what you do. And um, we always wanted to make sure that they had other interests outside of your one, one injury away, right, from being, from not being a player or, or whatever. So, so she, there's more to her than just basketball and, but for her, she could not have found a better fit with the team. It's about culture for her. 
and the team is a very um, supportive and family-like environment. So um, the players that they draft tend to be that way as well. And she just fit in and has loved it. Well, the WNBA and the NBA draft process is a little bit different. Well, I shouldn't say a little bit. I mean, there's huge differences. But just the age, for example, Mm -hmm. a WNBA player has to be 22 on the U.S. Mm -hmm. side. I'm talking about a U.S. player. Has to be 22, and she has to complete four years of college or be out of high school four years. Whereas NBA players, they have to be 19 Mm -hmm. and eligible after one year of college. So what is your take on that? I don't mind that at all from the women's side because, um, like I said, you're one injury away. And, you know, most of the girls, most of the girls by the time they graduate, because, you know, it's very, I'm not going to say rare, but it's unusual. It's still not um, like the norm to leave before your four years. That's right. Um, So to have that education, to get that degree is so important. And it was important to us um, that she she got a a quality degree um, on a great athletic experience. So let's talk a little bit about uh, salaries. Yeah. Stephanie, I know earlier we were talking about salaries. So this is a sensitive subject for me. So (laughs) I'm a business owner. I own an accounting practice. And just listening to you talking about making sure that your daughter has a backup plan, to me, like that, that will, if, if my daughter, you know, at some point has the luxury of joining the NBA or the, sorry, the WNBA, um, she'll have to have a backup plan given the current salaries. Like there, there is a, a, another career after that. So her graduating is so important and it just ticks me off because she's doing the exact same job. Your daughter's doing the same job as the guys in the NBA making a fraction of that salary. And I think that that's, you know, something that women face as a challenge in general. Mm-hmm. So what would your daughter be doing if uh, if she isn't doesn't play basketball or like you said she's one injury away? What's Plan B? Well, I'm not sure what Plan B is. I, I'm not sure she can actually see herself outside of uh, at this point outside of doing something in the industry. Um, she first started out in communications. She thought, well, maybe broadcasting. Then she kind of switched to psychology, and then she switched to children and human development. So she loves children. So I'm sure it would involve something would involve the with the kids, um, but probably still in a basketball world of some sort. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to go back just a, a little bit um, because the WNBA season starts um, usually in May and finishes mm-hmm. in October. Now, usually you graduate from college in April. Mm-hmm. So let's just talk about the timeline because I can only imagine how difficult it was for her to graduate um She had training camps and she had all these elements that she had to do prior to, to draft. Like how did that schedule work for her? It was crazy. We, you know, if you, especially if you go to the playoffs or the postseason in college, Mm -hmm. we went to, she uh, played in Tampa. So we were in Tampa. Then we flew to New York for the draft. She was home not long. And then she had to report to, to training camp. So, I mean, for her, she was used to that kind of a schedule just because at UConn, she would come home like three days at Christmas. She would be home a couple of weeks between the um, spring semester and summer school. They always had to do summer school. So she was used to being away. She's used mm-hmm. to a, a very um, busy schedule. So I think for her, they, uh, that's just what she knows. And it was fine. Um, but it was it was sad for me because I, I wanted her home a little bit before mm-hmm. she was gone again. But um, <laughs> it was it was good. It was fun. So now you're in Minnesota and you see the bright lights and the loud music and the commentators talking about your daughter. What was that experience like for the first game that you saw her play as a WNBA player? It was amazing. I'm going to tear up right now, I think. (laughs) I almost cried on that setup. (laughs) It was was amazing. My husband and I went up and... um, she's out there I'm like what is going on here like this is this is my daughter this is yeah. Lisa yeah. so yeah could not have been more proud of her and happy for her you know it just it's so funny when you say you could tear up because me too I remember <laughs> I remember going to see my son play um 
uh, in Orlando, and I was so excited. I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't care. I was just happy that I was there, yes. and my son yeah. was there, and I didn't care whether he played or not. I was mm-hmm. just like in tears thinking of the progression that he made going from, you know, yeah. high school, then us having to go to the U.S. a lot, playing tournaments, moving forward to him going undrafted, then him having to go to, uh, well, he played for the Miami Heat for mm-hmm. a few months and then he got waived, played G League and then went overseas. Mm-hmm. And that was so tough, you know, be lo- uh, thinking he was he was in Turkey and then he went to Greece. And then finally that NBA team, you know, what I mean, that, that opportunity came. But just sitting there, I didn't hear the noise at first and I didn't hear anything. I was just lo- staring at him at the bench, no, I'm sitting on the bench and I was just so enamored and I was just so happy for him. And yeah, I think I embarrassed him. He was, <laughs> he was looking at me like, can you stop? Yeah, <laughs> stop crying. <laughs> and as a mom, I mean, that's just that's just what it is. So, yeah. so I'm curious, Stephanie, when your baby gets that level, <laughs> how much tears will you cry? I I cry dropping them off at school, still to the bus. Like they started two weeks ago, I still cry every day. <laughs> like a proud cry now though, like because they're not crying anymore, so it's a little bit different. Um, but I, I don't worry so much about, like, obviously my emotional state. My head goes immediately to concern for security of sending my daughter somewhere <laughs> where I'm not. So, I, and I know that that's a double standard because I don't worry about my son in the same way, even though the risks are the same, potentially. I mean, statistically, they're not. Girls are obviously victimized in different ways. But was that a concern for you? Like, did you worry about her, her safety being away from home? Yes. I mean, I think as women, we worry about that probably on a, on a daily basis. Um, and then in college, you know, you, there are a lot of um, stories that you hear about what happens right. on college campuses. Um, it was scary. So I think those, Stephanie, and what I would say to you, me being the older woman here, <laughs> older mom, is to say, you know, you raise them and you're raising them, you know, until they leave and preparing them to leave. And I think as moms, that's our job to prepare them to leave. And so, yes, scared every day, but knowing knew that she would um, do the right thing and hopefully do the right thing and, <laughs> you know, keep herself safe and, and make good decisions. My husband would, I'm going to make sure he doesn't listen to this episode because he would be so happy to hear someone telling me, prepare them to leave. <laughs> I've been telling my young, our youngest is the little boy that he could stay home forever. <laughs> and that's definitely my intention. But uh, at this point, I'll get over the fact that he's the baby. So is your, your youngest a boy as well? Yes. So is he still playing football or what does he it, do now? He's still playing football. So he um, took a little, he plays division two football and he played here in St. Louis and now he's in Black Hill state in South Dakota. So, um, you know, I think I ba- I really babied him growing up. I mean, like, in the physical, my husband will tell you, you know, he was my baby. So uh, it took him a little bit longer, I think, to find his um, autonomy, like responsibility, like to be really responsible. So he's he's on the right track and excited to be where he is today. Oh, that's awesome. So he, my son has hope. <laughs> First, I'm not ruining him. Yeah. <laughs> no, I this week I'm like I miss my babies you know they'll always be your babies but it's true no matter, no matter no matter how old they are right eh? yeah yeah I was talking to my son earlier and I'm like what are you he's like um 27 going on 28 why are you asking me that because I'm your mom and I want to know yeah so I still don't know where he is but anyway so <laughs> so let's talk about COVID because that just shook the whole world up however your daughter, being an avid reader, decided to start a virtual book club. Tell me, Mom, are you one of the participants? I was a participant, but she uh, awesome. she got sidetracked with that too. So yeah, um, she didn't do didn't do very many episodes. But yes, I my family and my husband as well. But my family, we are very avid re- readers as well. So um, I don't know if it was something she learned or something that she was born with, just the love of. <laughs> to read but 
she's kind of a book nerd like we are, but yeah, she loves it. Oh, she likes mystery novels. Does that speak uh, to her character? Yeah, she likes mystery. She likes, you know, romance novels. Um, she's a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> yeah. That was a don't embarrass your daughter yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. She's I'm like, sorry. be quiet. <laughs> Let's talk about now her being in the bubble. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure she must have been happy to get that call and say, okay, we're going back to work. Let's just yeah. get in there. Now, we heard yeah. everything from an NBA perspective, what's going on in the bubble. But let's talk about the, uh, the I guess some people are calling it the wobble. What's going on? <laughs> like, how, how, is, how is she getting along in there? Uh, it's fine. I, I think um, it's still a little social, uh, socially isolating when you're not on the court or not practicing. Right. Um, um, so I you struggle with that, it's just the sense that you know, she wishes she could be out seeing, like she has a lot of players that she knows and are, you know, is friends with, but they don't really interact and socialize in the way that you would um, on a normal, in a normal way, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, it's really different this time. And there's a lot of downtime for them, even though they're playing every other day. Um, the, the time that they're off, they're just kind of vegging, I think, for the most part, trying to let their bodies heal as much as they can. And she's played the most this year in the WNBA. So she said, like, my body's tired. I'm tired. Mm-hmm. So it's been, um, they were, you know, really glad that they were able to play in some way this year. It's just been very strenuous on their bodies. There's been a lot of injuries this year, a lot of devastating injuries for um, players this year. So, uh, you know, for them, I don't know if it was worth it. You know, I don't know what they would say about that, but. It just makes me wonder because I don't think people understand the wear and tear um, it puts oh. on your body. And especially with the women starting like three, four years later than men. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's tough being yeah. a, a WN, well, an athlete, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because you're forever just straining your body like every single day. It's like. You know, I complain going to the office every single day, and all I do is walk and think. <laughs> and she's running, and I run to my car, and I'm like, whew. Yeah. <laughs> and here she's running for like 38 minutes straight, and I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it is a lot of pressure on their bodies. You know, she's 20, she'll be 24 next week. You know, she's 24 next week, and she she aches like an old person. Yeah. And I, for that, I'm, you know, I'm sad about that because I don't want anyone to hurt and she's so young to do that, but I couldn't pull her away if I wanted to. So, well, she acts as an athlete, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that's just the wear and tear. Like I was saying before, (laughs) that's, I mean, it's two years in and that's just what it is. But like you said, our, our players will do, they will sacrifice whatever they have to, right? It's like, (laughs) They will leaving, make those sacrifices. She's leaving to, for Turkey almost immediately after. So, um, you know, there isn't rest. There isn't downtime for the girls. Unfortunately, Stephanie, back to your point about the, the salary. salary. Yep. Yeah. That must be difficult, um, her having to play. So, okay. So WNBA players is like they play all year round. They don't, yes. it doesn't seem like they have downtime like men. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so she is supposed to be there by October 15th and she'll play up until the time season starts again in May. So it is, it is really, truly year round. So do you feel that WNBA players get, um, well, I shouldn't say the same, but yeah, we will. The same respect as a, as an NBA player. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. No. What, what are some of the differences for you that you've uh, experienced? Yeah, I feel like. Well, I feel like the the women's green game is definitely growing, right? Like I feel the product is getting better. So anytime a product gets better, Stephanie is a business owner for you, Wendy, I know it's like naturally um, it's going to become more popular. But if you ever go on, like if the NBA on their Twitter Twitter shouts out a, a female athlete, the amount of negative comments that are on that's Any right. post is astounding. It's shameful. Um, I think that to me is the biggest disrespect. It's just the the lack of respect for women in general, um, and um, and then maybe that the second thing that I would think of 
is the disrespect for them not feeling like they're maybe an athlete um, because they can't dunk or, you know, have to fight the good fight and go on. Absolutely. Well, this year, um, the WNBA, I guess, has the luxury of having their games televised on national major yes. networks. Yeah. So how do you feel about them getting more visibility now? I love it. I this So we have to buy the league pass normally to watch most right. of your games. Um, so I'm watching on my little iPad. This has been amazing. I have loved that we are able to actually, when she went to UConn, like all of her games were televised. And so it's so different. You go to the WNBA. So in college, they chartered planes here they're on economy or you know class planes yeah uh, pushed together it's just so different but i we've really enjoyed them being on tv and um i think i was reading the other day that back in 2017 the women hit like the 1.5 million mark as far as attendance goes in their games and they were about 20 year old club at that point and it took the men 26 years to get to that same attendance level. So I think we're on the right track. Yes. Um, we, but we live in a society, right, that is all about instant gratification. So we think right. that we should be at the same level as the NBA right now. And we're just, we have to remember we're in our infancy. We're just now starting to get games on TV. Um, but there's been a lot of people who are behind um, that that's made that possible. Can you imagine they're only getting more visibility now? Now, the league has existed, I believe, since 97, um, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, the WNBA. Can you imagine right. now, years later, it's like people are woken up and they're like, oh, wait, women actually do play this sport yeah. on a professional level. Like, who knew? It's yeah. like, I, I just think it's absolutely crazy. So, yeah. I mean, as a woman, I pray that there's more visibility. There's so much woman power now that's, you know, everybody's talking about women mm -hmm. power and it's, and it's so important. And you would think that people will respect um, basketball players as women and business women, you know, I mean, athletes as just opposed to just a player, which is so not fair. Yeah. yeah. So in the bubble or in the wobble, mm -hmm. Nafisa started a podcast with Asia Wilson. <laughs> Yes. A tea with A and Fee. I absolutely love it. What do you think about the uh, what, about their show? Oh my gosh! I uh, I talked to Asia's mom the other day, mm -hmm. and are so proud of our girls. Um, first of all, like Asia's like boisterous and outgoing, and the is more, you know, shyer and a little bit more laid back. But together, they make like this perfect they do. team on this podcast. It's I. My husband and I just laughed the entire time that we're listening to it. Um, I'm so proud of her. I watched a, a couple of episodes uh, this week. I love the show. I really, really do. And I love the questions that they ask. And, and they're just so quirky. So <laughs> I find that they're just, the, they make a good dynamic. I mean, I would just, I just suggest everybody watch that. I mean, I was, I was um, listening to the episode she had with Kevin Durant um and and uh Damian Lillard um that was a fun episode too and it was just fun to hear him speak I mean we just had his mom on our show a few days ago and then to see mm -hmm. another interview where yeah. we're learning a little bit more about him I thought it was fun and it just made me wonder hmm, yeah they're 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 on the same level you know what I mean you have a WNBA player and you have an NBA mm -hmm. player so it just the mix to me it was uh it, it was it was really interesting to see how they spoke amongst themselves right as players because after they were asking yeah. they was like well you guys have this and we don't have this you know what i mean like why mm -hmm. so it was good to hear their perspective as to what's going on yeah so. i will tell you i have been so thankful and really impressed with the level of support that the nba guys have given to the <clears throat> wnba women um you didn't see that so much in years past and you know everyone's out there they're like the when the WNBA kicked off, all the guys were wearing the orange hoodies, you know, just really in support. And um, I know some people are like, you know, we don't need the men to support us to validate us. But it's for me, it's not about that. For me, it's about supporting, you know, your brother and sister. And it's about right um, supporting women's sports. Um, so I personally, I couldn't love it anymore that they're actually showing that kind of support for the for the WNBA. Right. 
So Nafisa has been playing for, for quite some time now. So how do you think she's evolved as a player starting from, let's start from Jefferson City up until being a Lynx? <laughs> night and day. It's night and day. So it was, we used to, she was growing, you know, um, awkward in her body. So she would just kind of fall over sometimes, just like fall over. We're like, oh, that's a line monster again. Um, <laughs> she would just play. Now she studies the game. Now she understands the game. Right. Um, now she's a player. She doesn't just play the game. She's an actual player. And it's fun to watch that progression. It's, um, it's fun to see the, how, you know, her, the level of her understanding and her basketball IQ has gone up over the years. It's been fantastic. Well, playing the sport, I mean, it's, it's both physical and mental. Yes. Like you're saying, you have to understand the sport, but yeah. it's a lot of pressure. So how does she balance the two? Um, I really think for her, it's about the distractions, reading, um, just getting herself involved in things outside of basketball, because I think uh, if she just focused on that the entire time, that's not how her mind works. Like she needs some div- division there between my job and who I am as a person. Okay. And so I think that's how she manages it. That's what I would say. Actually, I have a question for both of you, both of you having a uh, biracial families. So let's start with you, Sarah. Having a biracial family, how has this Black uh, Lives Matter movement um, affected you personally and then your family? Um, you know, I grew up in a very small country, isolated town. So I think, um, you know, my first real exposure to even talking to someone outside of the, my own race, I was older probably junior high or something. Um, But it never, like, clicked to me that we were different. I mean, we didn't talk about that kind of stuff in my family, like differences, I guess, in people. And then um, as time has gone on, I think today I feel like things, even today, we got married back in 95, but today I feel like it's more racially divided um, in our country just because of, you know, things that are going on in politics and, um, I'm proud of my kids. We, we did a protest here in St. Charles where we live outside of St. Louis and getting involved and the piece is getting more involved. The WNBA is, um, I, I feel like on the front lines of social, um, inequality and justice and, um, all kinds of movements mm-hmm. that are real activists and I'm proud of her for getting involved in that. Um, but I would say, you know, the thing I feel the most is sadness. I, I see little kids, like we live in a neighborhood, right? And we see these little kids that walk by and most of them are, are white children that walk through my yard. Fine, whatever. Then I think about Trayvon Martin and my son. And I, mm-hmm. like, I wish my son could have that same freedom, like to walk through someone's yard and not have a problem. I'm going to cry. It's just like, yeah, I know you're getting me too. I know me too. I'm like, <laughs> I um I'll, I'll help you out here. So in in Canada we are we have don't have as significant of a divide as obviously we can see in the media that you guys do in the U.S. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that the Black Lives Matter movement has, for a white person like myself, given me the opportunity to feel like I can say what I want to say and have my opinion and defend my children the way that I want to, and have a voice for my family that previously was maybe a little bit frowned upon and we'd accepted some of the position and knew, you know, we say this all the time when we had an appointment at the bank, I go alone. Or Mm -hmm. if we have a big business meeting, I go by myself and test the water to see if it's appropriate. The the audience can handle my seven foot black husband. Um, And we've really had the opportunity to say, who cares if they can't handle it? We don't want to do business with you anyway. And that's a really new position for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, to free up um, some of the, 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 the things that my kids you know may have faced or would have faced had I continued to approach parenting from a scared point of view we're heading it, we're hitting it face on and you know if you don't like me and my my black family then I'm all right with that we'll, we'll move on yeah. do you think right. Nafisa and Alex 
could, well, I guess they could possibly face that, but does that worry you? Because they're a biracial com- uh, couple as well. So do you think that, oh my gosh, like my, now that this is so like in everybody's face, I mean, they want to buy a home, just say, and they want to go to the bank and get a loan. I mean, do you think that, oh my gosh, like they could be facing these issues as well? I don't, I never think about that from that perspective. And maybe it's because um, like we have, from the day that the kids were, you know, this is something that my parents said to me actually before I got married, Sarah, you know, you're, you're going to be bringing children into the world. Um, are you ready for that? And I said, as long as we love our children and they know that they're loved, we'll be fine. We will be fine. Absolutely. And I, that's just how we've always approached um, everything. So, you know, Stephanie, I'm sorry that you've had to like, you know, test the waters. That's um, not something we ever did. It's just we were who we are, and you if you don't like us, that, that's fine. You don't have to like us. And um, if it meant some opportunities weren't there, we were fine with that too. So I feel like we've brought our kids up the same way. It's like you go out, you make your opportunities, they're going to come. Um, but I'm not as naive to think that they may not face some challenges as well. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like as bad as things are, it feels right now, I feel like there is progress. Like, I feel like because now we can say those things that I'm hoping change is, is going to come. Well, I think we all are praying yeah. for change. Yes. I mean, 2020, just go away already. Go <laughs> away. <laughs> just go away. Yeah. Like, oh yes. my God. So, <laughs> Okay, mom, if I were to ask you one word to describe Nafisa, what would that one word be? Good. One word to describe her as a player, what would that be? Consistent. Love it. I would have said good. (laughs) I would have said the same answer. (laughs) So we always close the show by asking our expert moms. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, and for me, it's very interesting um, with you being a WNBA mom. So what advice would you give a parent to a up and coming amateur player? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Tell Stephanie what she should do. (laughs) Hmm. I, I think for me, what I would say, and I'm not really, I don't like to give people advice. So um, because I think everybody's situation is different, but if I had to, I would say, enjoy the ride. I would say, encourage, don't push and, or, you know, support, not push and focus on them being good humans. I, I love that support, not push. Yeah. I love yeah. That. It's like giving them a chance to really yeah. feel out, uh, what they're doing and allowing them to have that opportunity just to to see what it could be on their own as opposed to a parent telling them what it is. Right. We ask, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we ask every every season before any we started a new season on anything, is this what you want to do? Um, we'll support you if you do and we'll support you if you don't. But once you commit, you're you've committed. Um yes. and that's just how we've approached it. So yeah, I never wanted, we never wanted to feel, I have told, even when she was in college, like UConn, I said, if, you know, if you decided tomorrow that you didn't want to play, I'm going to support you in that, but you need to be able to articulate at least why you're not, you know, what's going on. And so we've always, that's how we've tried to approach the support not put. Oh, absolutely. And just to add on to that, I mean, I used to ask my boys why they wanted to do it because you know, if the reason, I mean, of course, their reasons are their reasons, right? But I needed to right. understand and then help them understand, you know, I mean, does this reason really make sense? Because I didn't mm-hmm. want them to put themselves in a situation where, you know, five hours into it, they're, it's just going right. to be chaos, yes. right? Especially little boys, you know, I mean, it's like the end of yeah. the planet, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you so much for your for your advice. And also thank you. Thank you so much for wanting to come on courtside moms and talking to us about your beautiful daughter, Nafisa. Thank you so much. Join me and Steph every week on courtside moms, where you get a courtside seat outside of the arena. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe and listen for free on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Baby